All right, it looks like everybody that we were expecting, uh, at least on the speaker side, is here. So you see we just got another person joined us. But I think in the interest of everyone's time, we can go ahead and get started. So Julie, if you'd like to go. Yeah, of course. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for jo joining us today, this afternoon. Uh, I just briefly wanted to speak up and say we've got a couple new faces uh, from our Woodard and Curran team. We've got Christy Kennedy joining us. She's going to be helping us support these efforts as we move forward. And of course, you guys have been hearing a little bit from Sally Johnson. She's going to be our new project manager. And with that, I'll go ahead and let Sally take it away. Great, thanks, Julie. Uh, so as Julie mentioned, my name is Sally Johnson. I'm with Woodard and Curran. Um, so I'm supporting uh, the city and the county with all of the San Pasquale Valley Groundwater Sustainability Plan implementation. Uh, so I'm taking over this role from Rosalind Prickett, who I know uh, you heard from back in June at your last stakeholder workshop. Um, so appreciate your patience with <laughs> anything uh, that I'm still learning, but um, we have a lot of great information to share with you today. We're really excited to be hosting this workshop. Um, I have with me Christy Kennedy, um, from also from Winter and Current. So Christy, if you wanted to say a few words. Sure. Hi. Um, it's really nice to meet you all today and to really get into a lot of the details of the project that have um, been happening over the last couple of months. Um, I'm the principal in charge on this project, also um, a big part of the Groundwater Resources Association, um, and I've been working on GSPs up and down the state for a number of years, so it's nice to be able to bring that information statewide, um, you know, and help as we move towards the monitoring and the implementation of your GSP. Thanks, Sally. Uh, great. Uh, we also have, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can... Um, send a chat over to Michael Eggleton. Micah Eggleton, he's with the Wittering Current team. He's helping us. Uh, he's He's been involved with this GSP for the past several years, um, but uh, he's helping with the technical side of this meeting as well as general support on this whole effort. Um, we also have with us from the consulting side, uh, the Jacobs team. Um, if you guys wanted to, I think you've probably introduced yourself before, but if you want to introduce yourselves again, that'd be great. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paula Silva, and I I am uh, the project manager from the Jacob side, and also a water resources specialist. Nate, do you want to introduce yourself? Hopefully, folks can hear me. I had some technical issues logging in, but um, yeah, Nate Brown. I'm a hydrogeologist on this project, and have been guiding uh, a lot of the technical work uh, with regard to the modeling. Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Mark, Mark Elliott, I'm a principal with uh, Jacobs. Thank you. All right, well, we'll get right into it. I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, we know that this workshop got uh, delayed initially. It was supposed to be scheduled a little earlier in the year, but part of the delay was related to some of the additional work that we're presenting today. So um, today we're really going to be talking about um, the continued effort with our management action number seven from the GSP, the surface water recharge evaluation. Um, we're gonna be giving you some updates on a few of our um, technical memoranda that we have been working on that uh, we distributed via um, email uh, last week to this group. So for today, uh, we just wanna remind everybody a little bit about the format. Um, so this is a stakeholder workshop, so anyone is welcome to ask questions or provide comments. You can do so if some of you may have a raise hand feature and some of you may not. Uh, it appears there's two different versions of GoTo that some have more buttons than others. <laughs> um, but if you'd like to comment, uh, we would encourage you to put a message in the chat, um, or if you have a raise hand feature, feel free to use that. Um, we'll pause a few different times during the workshop before we get to public comments, so there'll be an opportunity to unmute yourself if um, you have a question along the way. Um, 
we will have public comment at the end of our agenda items. Um, and if you have any follow-up kind of comments or questions, you can email them to Stacy. Um, her email address is shown here and you've been receiving emails from her related to this workshop and these deliverables. Um, we had a question, it looks like we had a question in the chat about when comments are, written comments are due. Um, we don't have a firm deadline set, but we would prefer, I think, in the next week or so would be helpful for us. Um, Stacy, did you have a preference? No, that sounds good. I think within a week or two would be perfect. Mm -hmm. if that's reasonable. Um, but we're, we're happy to take comments anytime. Of course. Um, so today we're just going to do a quick overview for folks who maybe haven't been um, at the previous workshop. The last workshop was in June, so we know it's been a while for everyone. Um, so we'll just remind you about this overall project. Um, we'll just revisit kind of the, the revisions we made to the first uh, technical memorandum on the evaluation criteria that was made in response to the feedback received in June. Um, we'll be going through the two technical memoranda that were distributed last week. Those are for task two and task three, the stream bed investigation and the water sources for potential recharge projects. And then we'll have our public comment period or public comment time and then next steps and closing remarks. Um, while we'll have a pause kind of at the end of each of our agenda items for clarification questions, we would really like to have our public comment at the end. We wanna make sure that we're able to get through all the material. Um, we should have plenty of time for public comments and we can always go back to any slides that you want to discuss in more detail. So just a reminder on the scope of the surface water recharge evaluation. Um, ultimately, a preliminary feasibility study is going to be developed that will summarize surface water recharge opportunities in the San Pasqual Valley. Um, it's going to include the sections listed here. So there's kind of six sections. Um, the evaluation criteria, which was task one or technical memorandum one, stream bed investigation, um, water sources for potential recharge, potential recharge strategies, model simulations and results, and then an evaluation of the benefits to our groundwater dependent ecosystems or GDEs. What you see here is each of these memoranda are building upon each other, right? So we start out with what are those evaluation criteria that'll help us with determining feasibility um, and prioritization of recharge strategies. Um, the stream bed investigation involves a lot of uh, field data and modeling to better understand what our opportunities are for surface water recharge. The water sources for potential recharge is really looking at, you know, where can this water come from that we might be able to use and store in the basin should, should such a project need to be implemented to support overall basin sustainability. Um, TM4 further develops those water sources into actual strategies um, and helps develop the information that we need to evaluate feasibility. There'll be some model updates and simulations um, of the different recharge strategies. Um, and at the end of the day, we're also going to have this information on potential effects of these strategies on these groundwater ecosystems. So a quick reminder that this um, preliminary feasibility study is not the GSP, the five-year update to the GSP. Um, this is just one element of the GSP. So the current GSP and our estimates show that the basin is sustainable. Um, should those future sustainability conditions change and the GSA or Groundwater Sustainability Agency determines that enhanced recharge strategies are needed, then the preliminary feasibility study can be used to help inform decisions on that mitigation planning. So this feasibility study is gonna be created from those six TMs we just walked through, and it'll be an appendix to the five-year update to the GSP. So again, it's just one element of the overall groundwater sustainability plan. The intent here is that we're going to be exploring some of these options now before there's any sort of need to actually implement a recharge strategy in the basin. Um, so, you know, we're really here to get your input on what approaches are reasonable, realistic. You know, we know that you know your, your properties and your systems best. So if there's anything in here that, you know, seems like, hey, we've really missed something important, like that's the kind of feedback we'd really love to hear, right? 
Here's our overall schedule on the surface water recharge evaluation leading up to the preliminary feasibility study. Um, so we're right here with task, we're right here with task uh, uh, three here. Um, two and three are here in January workshop. We'll be coming back to you again in April um, to give you an update um, on the task four recharge strategies, um, as well as uh, some initial um, updates related to the model simulation. We're, we're going to be um, doing a public draft for your review of the feasibility study in the fall of 2023. Um, and so you'll have plenty of time for review of that uh, feasibility study, which um, you'll have already seen all of these TMs along the way. So um, hopefully uh, that incorporates, you'll see kind of your feedback and how it's been incorporated before we even get to that, before we get to that draft feasibility study. I'm going to pause real quick and see if there's any questions so far. Not seeing any, I'll move on. Um, so just a quick reminder of task one, the evaluation criteria, technical memoranda. So um, this is our surface, our, our evaluation criteria used uh, for the different strategies. So the surface water recharge evaluation is considering these recharge strategies. We're exploring those, as I mentioned, in task three and task four. Task three we're presenting today, task four will be in April. Um, those strategies will be evaluated against these criteria, and these criteria were initially discussed or, or were last discussed with you in June of 2022, and um, they've since been revised based on the feedback we received. We're not going to go through everything because you've already seen it once, um, but I wanted to show the weighting that is in this uh, revised TM um, that we did after that June meeting. Um, here, you'll see the eight different criteria. There's kind of two parts to criteria seven, um, but really we want to show you that the criteria that are prioritized ultimately are related to um, groundwater levels and the effectiveness and efficiency of the recharge along with feasibility. So we're trying to balance the different um, different criteria and kind of different pros and cons, if you will, of the different recharge strategies, but really prioritizing, you know, groundwater levels and what is and is not feasible to implement. Uh, this TM, I believe, is posted to the website at this point. I'll pause here just to see if there's any little questions on this at all. Moving right along uh, to task two, the stream bed investigation. So this is TM2 that was distributed on, I believe, Friday. So some of you may or may not have had a chance to review it yet, and that's totally fine. Um, we're gonna go through quite a bit of technical information in the next set of slides. Um, so as we go through it, the things that we'd love for you to be thinking about are um, any points of clarification that you would like from us, or if there's um, anything that that seems off from your personal experience, so thinking about, you know, does this align with what you experience being out there every day? Um, at this point, I will invite Nate to go ahead and um, unmute himself. We'll move on to the first set of slides. Thank you, Sally. So yeah, so the stream bed investigation task. For that, we focused on this eastern portion of the basin where groundwater recharge from streams mostly occurs. Um, the overall goal, when we left off with the GSP, there was acknowledgement of some uncertainty regarding stream flow characteristics or stream bed characteristics rather. Um, so this investigation was really aimed at reducing that uncertainty um, to improve the overall confidence in the model water budgets along that creek, San Isabel Creek. And so with regard to the scope, it was basically three activities. There was a stream channel survey, uh, some stream bed infiltration testing, and a photographic survey. And I'll kind of walk through at a high level each, each of those activities. Next slide, please. 
So stream channels, um, why do we care about stream channels? Uh, they affect stream flow retention and recharge characteristics, basically. So I'm, I'm showing here uh, just two little cartoon images. If you imagine the stream flow moving through those two channels as being about equal and just their shapes are different, um, the, the wider channel has a greater opportunity for infiltration. It doesn't mean you'll get more infiltration, but just by having more contact over more area, um, you have more opportunity for that infiltration. So if you click forward, um, kind of thinking about that for this project, um, what, what happened was we selected five different transects and a transect is just a line cut across the channel at each of these locations shown here on the map. Um, we, we wanted to have a decent spatial coverage. So these are not, these are roughly every river mile or so, not exactly every river mile, but you know, just wanted to get a decent spread on that Eastern end of the basin where we have four locations along Isabel Creek Road in yellow, and then the orange, the fifth transect was a portion of uh, Guajiro Creek. Uh, next slide, please. So this work was completed this last summer in June. And uh, what I'm showing here is a plot. Your vertical axis is just elevation. And the, the horizontal axis is the distance from the left bank. So on that map, if you imagine standing at each of those spots looking downstream, that's the left, the, the left bank would be kind of that southern, that southern bank. And really, I'm just trying to show here how, how the basin, as you move downstream, how the shape of that channel changes. Um, so if you click forward one, Sally, you know, if we take that top transect, for example, and just kind of make a cartoon rendition of that shape and imagine some water in it, that, that's, that's how that would look. Whereas if you go down to the purple line, you know, the fourth transect, much wider, you can kind of see it goes from 250 feet, you know, wider, so to nearly 600 feet. So it's much greater opportunity for recharge uh, infiltration you know, as you move down downstream. So this is a type of information that um, we're going to use to update the uh, the GSP model. Um, just a quick note back in the GSP, um, just to get that that version 1.0 of that model going, we went with rectangular channels, just very simple. Um, so what we're moving toward with this version 2.0 of the model is to have these more realistic uh, stream geometries built in, because now that we're really focused on stream flow characteristics and infiltration characteristics, as I mentioned earlier, that that shape of the channel matters. Um, yes, yeah, so we can move on. Uh, let's see. So yeah, um, down to the next activity, uh, the stream bed infiltration testing. So here the goal was to really look at some site specific infiltration characteristics along different points of San Isabel Creek. And so this picture here, um, if you kind of just point it to, as I follow along here, we basically got a water truck and it, it's coming off of a hill down to this, this setup here where it flows through a flow meter and the table there. And then it continues down into, um, there's a metal ring there on the, on the ground, there you go. And we basically just measure the flow rate to keep the water level inside of uh, the metal ring. If you click, click one more time, um, you, we basically held the water level constant inside of that inner ring anywhere from a half an hour to about two hours. And this, this happened at those first four transects. So all along is San Isabel Creek. Um, that time, the timing of a half hour to two hours was really based on the constraints of when we had water truck availability and trying to stay out of the way of fall harvest, um, ag operations. Um, but the way it works is you, you measure the flow rate into these rings. We, we use both double and single ring infiltrometers for this, for this effort. Um, and there's basically a technique where you can take those flow rates and apply some uh, corrections to come up with a vertical hydraulic connectivity. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, so what is hydraulic connectivity and, and why, why is it important? So the, the hydraulic connectivity, you'll often see it refer, I often see it referred to as K. Um, uh, it, it's basically just a measure of how easily a fluid can move through that soil and rock. In this case, we're obviously talking about water. Um, 
it really depends on how those pore spaces are arranged and interconnected. So this graphic to the right here, starting with the gravel, you know, if you imagine water flowing down through it, it flows through it pretty readily. You move it into sand, um, the pathway of that flow maybe becomes a little more tortuous. You move to silt, even more tortuous. There's more and more resistance as you move to the right. Um, high hydraulic connectivity for gravel, low hydraulic connectivity toward the clay. And so what does this mean for the recharge strategies? You know, the sands and gravels, you're going to have rapid infiltration where you have a high hydraulic connectivity, and those are going to be more suitable for recharge strategies. Um, whereas if you're over in the silt clay end of things, you're going to have slower infiltration, lower hydraulic connectivity, um, less suitable. And so hydraulic connectivity, um, we're focused on it because it's one of the, you know, key controlling factors for the rate of infiltration. And so we need to have an understanding of how that, how hydraulic connectivity varies across the landscape as we think about these different strategies. Let's see, so yeah, the results, again, just showing the map of the four uh, transect locations. I should note that at each of those um, locations, there were two sets of tests done. Um, click forward one more. There is the, those, uh, the tests that occurred on the main channel. So kind of in the main, when, when there's lower flow conditions where that flow tends to be. And then on the banks, when you have higher flow conditions and it overtops those banks, we, we did tests there as well. In addition, uh, we also collected some sediment samples and had them um, run through what's called a grain size distribution. Whoops, not quite yet. Um, and there, that's just done for uh, what, what you see listed in the table here, the material, you know, is this a gravel, a sand, a silt, or a clay, or what combination? So that was done at a total of eight locations, you know, uh, two at each of these transects. And this table is showing the results um, by the bank versus the channel. And so you can kind of see in the main channel, it's a pretty clean sand, a poorly graded sand. And it has hydraulic connectivities in feet per day that are in the hundreds. Um, whereas on the bank, you can see there's a finer silt content. So that's some sandy silt, silty sand. And the hydraulic connectivities are more in, in say, the dozens of feet per day. As a whole, if you just kind of average it all, it's around 100 feet per day. So if you click forward, I wanted to plot those out. This is a real standard plot that folks like me go to when we start thinking about hydraulic connectivity. Um, the blue box there is the main channel. And you can see that plots in a in a clean sand, and uh, the the light brown box there plots within a silty sand. So matches up really well with the sieve test data. You know the the fact that we have poorly graded sand and sandy silts. And so as a final click here, at a high level, we were really happy to have had the opportunity to to do this. These are important data, and the good thing is it all comes back and it looks to be. Uh, really consistent, which is great. And as a whole, it just means the, the we now have evidence that the Isabel Creek um, sediments are they're permeable. They're high hydraulic connectivity. And so this information is going to be used um, to update the modeled uh, stream bed properties moving forward. Last activity um, is a photographic survey. Here, the goal is to try to document how far surface water flows in the creek after storm events. You know, we, we don't have stream gauge data down in the basin. Um, and so this is one way to at least get some information that can, um, in the absence of stream gauge data, give us some information of, you know, how far does, does stream flow make it in this, in this area. So we were scoped to go out and conduct one photo survey. Um, so we had to really watch the weather and kind of have staff on call mm -hmm. and uh, as luck would have it like literally just weeks ago the the early half of january had a whopper uh down there and that was a good opportunity to get out in the field and as an example on this this photo here what um let's see where i don't see your pointer but if you could point to that leading edge um and the blow up the bottom there on the left, I guess the yellow is there. There you go. So what we're trying to do is, yeah, map, get a 
you know, kind of a waypoint, a point in time and a photograph of where the stream flow kind of braids out and infiltrates into the stream. And then in future update efforts, um, given that there, we just don't have stream gauge data, the more of those points you get through time in later updates, those become really useful kind of targets as we update the model to see, hey, does the model end up with about the right locations for where stream flow um, ends? And so next slide, we, uh, let's see, is that updating? Here we go. Um, yeah, so here's a, some of the example photos from, I believe this was January 16th, uh, which was a holiday. So we had one of our staff nice enough to go out on our holiday, but um, just I've noted the locations on the map here. So starting with location one upstream, you can see uh, San Isabel Creek's flowing away there and moving downstream by the bridge, really widened out over that area. Um, we got a quick shot at Santa Maria, a lot more quiescent uh, flow over there. You can see kind of that shiny surface. And then Isabel Creek Road, it was just flowing right over it. So um, it was a pretty unique opportunity to actually get out and, and see this. Um, and I think, you know, now that this has been done, I, I think it would be a great uh, alternative data set, you know, through time, if there was a way to periodically get this kind of information. As I say, for folks like me who are trying to calibrate these tools to have something to tie it to on the surface system, um, this will be really helpful going down the road. So, uh, and then, yeah, lastly, um, you know, we've been, we have, had some texts with, with some stakeholders, Matt Whitman, um, thank you so much. You've been really, really helpful um, in, in just alerting us if, if you see stream flow in key areas. So anyone that's working out there, living out there, if you notice stream flow, um, these are just, yeah, very helpful. Kind of gives us a heads up. We may or may not be able to get someone out there to do anything about it, but um, documenting this information when it occurs is, is helpful. So thank you for that. So um, we're going to pause here, and again, we're going to have uh, a longer public comment period after we get through the next set of slides. But we wanted to pause here and see, we just shared quite a bit of um, information. We know that TM2 has a lot of technical details in it, so we'd like to just pause and see if anybody had any questions um, to clarify any of the information that Nate just shared or some of the details of the TM. Um, and then we'll have a, a larger discussion during the public comment period. Uh, yes, Peter, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, it looks like I was able to. Great. Um, I would just um, add probably to uh, Nate's request that when it's raining and there's no flow in the creek, a photograph of that would also be pretty useful. For example, we had you know rain for yesterday and the evening before, and there was you know at this fourth circle there was no flow in Wahito Creek at the bridge yesterday. So. Yes, thank you. I know we had quite a bit of uh, rain in the fall as well, where we had no flow. Um, I believe we had no flow in the creek either. So uh, that's a great comment. We appreciate that. Um, this is Frank Conine. Uh, going on Peter's comment, yes, it was interesting that at the Wahito Bridge on 78 and the Santa Isabel Bridge on 78, there was no water flow this morning but the Santa Maria Creek was running really good this morning and it didn't start running until the rains had, uh, for, for instance, last night after the rains had stopped, it was not running yet this morning it was running good. So those are just observations. A question that I have is when you looked at the, the amount of permeability of the sand, you talked about the water being able to move at anywhere from 150 feet to 116 to 552 vertical feet in a day and on the main channel. 
And my question is, that's what the sand at the top says, but do we really have an idea of what is happening 50 feet down? Yeah, great question, Frank. So a couple of things to note there. So the units there of feet per day looks like a speed, but it's not. So that's one thing that, that doesn't mean water will move at a, 100 to 500 feet per day. That, that's like a resistance term. Um, but that said, it's still, yeah, it's very permeable. And you're right that the, the infiltration testing provides really important information of kind of those near surface deposits that are looser. And as you go down in depth, you can imagine just due to compaction alone that, that permeability, that hydraulic connectivity would likely decrease, even if you had the same material, just because it's not like loose beach sand, you know, at depth. And so the infiltration tests alone doesn't, they don't tell us what's going on in the deeper parts. Like if you have a depth to water of a hundred feet, you know, there's still some uncertainty of what the deeper materials are right above the water table. And that that's in fact discussed in Tech Memo 2, where we're, we're proposed, we're, we're implementing a, an approach that accounts for you know, some assessment of what those deeper vertical hydraulic connectivity values are. So you're, you're right on, Frank, those, those deeper things matter. Um, these infiltration tests were great for the near surface, but that's not the end of the story. Yeah. So following up on that question, and especially in light of the fact that the river did run uh, in the middle of January, did you do any correlation to the river running when you were visually seeing water running and the USGS monitoring well that's behind Whitman's office to 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 get an idea at what point you saw uh, a groundwater level starting to respond to a surface uh, pressure. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right on top of this, Frank. We we did. Um, we had a couple of again in, in the tech memo too. We show some. We show a plot that shows kind of the timing of how different things started to happen. With starting with the rain gauge at that Sima station down in the valley, looking at stream flow and this the, from the three different gauges, and then for a couple different monitoring wells, when those trends started to all of a sudden you know head, head up. So um, I want to say it was you know a day or two before like after there was a particularly wet period within there of like within one week there was like three inches of rain or something um and it, it was a couple of days there you go so that uh yeah that light brown line if you show the depth of water of sdsy that thing sees that kind of launches up that vertical black dash line is the day we did the survey the photo survey okay, okay. um you can see it, it took a couple of days from a really, really intensely wet, you know, short duration, high intensity period for that water level to start to head up. I think when I last che checked that water level a day or so ago, that water level has risen about 10 feet um, from that base there. And it's starting to round off a bit, but then I, I think you guys got some more rain. So I'll be curious to see how that thing um, continues to track. But uh, yeah, it's it's a great question. So it's, you got to really look at all three of these to try to make sense of um, their infiltration is one thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean groundwater recharge. It's not the same number. There's a there's a timing effect here too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm not seeing any other comments right now, so we'll go ahead and move into TM3. Uh, so task three is the water sources for potential recharge projects. So um, again, we'll be going through the information that was presented in the TMs or in, in TM3. Um, and a couple of things to keep in mind are um, as you hear about these recharge sources um, this is still very you know it's still preliminary um, if you know if you have any concerns about some of the source water information um, those are things that we'd love to hear in the public comment periods um, you'll hear about a potential kind of recharge conveyance and recharge um, basin location 
option. Um, so if you have any concerns about those locations or any thoughts related to those locations, please let us know. Um, and then any other sort of considerations when we're thinking about the feasibility of developing strategies for recharge based on these water sources. So just a couple of things to keep in mind as we move through the next couple of slides, and then we'll go into our public comment period um, after that. Okay, yes, yeah, so let's move into our task three here. So the water sources for potential recharge projects. So the first thing um, we're, we're up against here is we want to assess the water sources first um, before we even think about things like feasibility. You know, first just have to hypothetically get some sense of what kind of, what volume of water might be available on some frequency to do something, you know, beneficial. And the later steps in task four, we'll look at cost and permitting and, and, and all the extra things that would go with that. And so the water sources, you know, we're thinking about quantity and timing, uh, the reliability, consistency, operations, legality. There's, a, there's ultimately going to be a balance that has to be looked at in task four. Um, but first things first, this, this focus is on, yeah, just sources of water. And I'll preface that by saying the way we have approached this is, um, you know, the future is uncertain. Obviously, the, the climate change and the weather patterns in the future are all uncertain. And the, the way we've approached this is to look at the same 15 year historical period from water years 2005 through 2019. And because that, that 15 year period included a good variety of hydrology, wet, wet dry, extended drought. Um, and by, by looking at that, we've approached it of hypothetically, if the basin had been operated differently over that same period, what type of what what volumes of water might have been made available hypothetically to do this exercise so that that's how we have approached this so we can move to the next slide <clears throat> okay so again uh, results are hypothetical at this point but we we included these four different types of sources listed here so first off just stream flows uh, stormwater capture, you know, in, in San Isabel Creek, uh, looking at both uncontrolled and controlled releases from Sutherland. And then finally, the uh, raw water uh, delivered through the Ramona Municipal Water District from the, the Water Authority. Um, on the map, I think that's the, the purple pipeline areas kind of in the southern southern part of the basin there. So though, those are the, the four sources of water um, that we are looking at as part of this analysis. And so I'm just going to walk through this first one here, and then I'll pass it over to my colleague. Uh, but for, with regard to stream flow, stormwater mm -hmm. capture, you know, as we mentioned earlier, that east end of the basin, um, mm -hmm. you know, is the best location to look at things like excess stream flows when it's available. And so on that map there, I'm showing it uh, Isabel Creek Road, maybe maybe highlight mm -hmm. that, Sally. You see there to the left of the red? Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing you, oh, there you are. Um, yeah, so anything to the right of that is what, really, what we're looking at in terms of the main focus. And the reason being, when you look at there, there's a potential for just large quantities of water when it is available and a really large surface area for infiltration um, as task two, just we just walked through, um, we now have direct evidence. I mean, it's a really good, big permeable area. So it's, it's well suited for infiltration types of strategies. You just need the water. Um, so one idea that we're thinking about is um, if you think of periods of excess stream flow, like which just occurred a couple of weeks ago, you know, if you hypothetically had a way to capture that excess stream flow passing by, say, Isabel Creek Road and, and turn it around and, and put it to beneficial use back in that east end of the basin to try to retain more of that, that could be a strategy. Once it passes Isabel Creek Road and flows to the west there, it largely stays in the stream and then just exits, exits the basin. Um, when we look at that historical 15-year period, uh, there were times where according to model, again, we don't have stream gauge data, and this is a, 
this this model is being updated as we speak. So I guess I would say that it's it's uncalibrated at this point, but it gives us an estimate of what kind of stream flows might pass this Bell Creek Road. And there are values up to like 11,000 acre feet. Again, there's a lot of years where it's zero, but there were some times where, um, you know, if, if we think opportunistically, there could be a pretty sizable volume of water that might be available uh, to do something beneficial with. Challenges, of course, is it's drought sensitive. Um, those excess stream flows don't happen very often, maybe a couple times a decade, something like that. So, uh, but this is one of the one of the things we're trying to think about um, as we move into the task four recharge strategies. Like if, if there was a way to capture some of this stuff, uh, some of this water, yeah, what, what are some ideas for how we could try to retain more of that? I think with this, I will turn it over to Paula. Thank you, Nate. Um, so we are now going to talk about the Southern Land Reservoir as a potential source. Um, it is located upstream the Santa Isabel Creek. It's owned and operated by the city of San Diego. They provided historical records that we, we use for this analysis. What you see here on the right is a frequency plot of the annual spills of this reservoir is um, is from 1954 to 2021 so it's basically all the years that it has been operating except from last year and um, the important finding we had is that it's rarely that um, the storage reach maximum capacity and then spills over and only six percent of the time of these years there was a volume above 5,000 acre feet that could have been used uh, uh, downstream the, the reservoir. So this is the most important finding and these are uncontrolled releases because this just happens when the reservoir reaches its maximum capacity and spills over the weir. So if you click to the next slide, Sally, uh, sorry, the next um, item here, so what you see here at the bottom is I, for this uh, historical period that Nate mentioned from 2005 to 2019, we did an average of how the reservoir operates. So what you could see here is that on average, um, the storage level is around the 5,000 acre feet. The, the inflows to, to the reservoir are only flow that uh, runoff that flows from its watershed or the rain that uh, falls into its surface. And there are control releases, as you can see here, that, that, is, that, are, that are the result of an operation that go to the Santa Isabel, San Vicente Reservoir and some um, only during three years were releases to Ramona Municipal Water District. You could see here the average volumes and also you could see that for the specific historical period that we were analyzed, there were not uncontrolled releases. So um, this as a potential source is for uncontrolled releases is very unlikely as, as we mentioned at the beginning. Of course, the advantage is that when it happens is a significant amount. You could see here at the top plot that there were some years that those spills were 45,000 uh, acre feet, so that is a significant amount. But as mentioned before, um, the challenge is that is is not very common and is drought sensitive, and are very rare. And also another uh, challenge that we have with this with, with this source is that once it's released, it goes to the sand uh, spill. It goes to the Santa Isabel Creek, and before it gets to the to the San, uh, San Pascual Valley you will have some losses for the conveyance through the creek. And also we need to consider that these need to be paired with other strategy to, to capture releases as, as the one mentioned by, by Nate on, on a stream, uh, storm captures. And just to give you an example, for instance, in this very heavy um, storm event that we have, of course, in a few days, actually in five days, the, the storage in in southern land increase uh, by um, 2,500 around, but because the level of the storage was way below um, to get the spill level, 
that there wasn't any flood releases. So even in this uh, very wet situation, it's a combination on how the, the reservoir is actually operated to get to, to the spill. So now we're gonna talk about the same Sutherland Reservoir, but with a potential control releases. So what you see here on the right are uh, the stack bars are the, uh, sorry, yes, the stack bar are, are the, um, the hypothetical control releases to Santa Isabel Creek, and that is the blue, and the yellow are the historical control releases to San Vicente and Ramona Municipal Water District that we mentioned previously. So that is how currently the, mo the storage operates. So we, we put on top of those historical releases some additional releases that could hypothetically be um, uh, released to the Santa Isabel Creek, and then we estimated what would the storage drop level drop, right? So that is what you see here on the dashed uh, black line. So the finding is that there might be available control releases um, with some operational changes in the reservoir while maintaining a similar is a historical storage level and the releases that have been done in this period. Please take notice that when um, there, there is low storage, there are not control releases. So those control releases that were hypothetical uh, analyzed were only when you have enough um, volume in the reservoir to do that. So the advantages is, as opposed to the previous case, these are more predictable and there, are not, there is no need of significant changes in, in, the, in the reservoir. And um, the challenges is also somehow uh, also drought sensitive because, of course, the storage level depends on, on, on the runoff that is subject to impact on climate change and, and hydraulic variability. Um, and, and, um, and also it's important to know that there will be the need of additional operational agreements beyond what we already have with, uh, the city already has with uh, Ramona and also for its own uses to, um, to be stored in San, in San Vicente Reservoir. I see we have a, a question. Yeah, uh, yes. this is Ricky. This is Ricky. Um, if, is there the potential to release water into San Isabel Creek in higher water years, and that water could then be, it, it could then boost the, the groundwater storage. So we'd, we'd have a, a smaller chance of, of having the groundwater levels in the basin reduced to a, an undesirable level. Yeah, thank you for your question, Ricky. That is uh, what we are going to be analyzing in, in task four. What is the, how these potential water sources could be used for, for the recharge strategies. The first step on this process is just to see how much water we have available, potentially available for that purpose. But at this point, we don't know. And we are highlighting here or just uh, mentioning that um, the, the, for this specific, the specific source, in addition to water being released, we need to consider how much it will be lost while conveying to the San Vicente Basin. And then, just as you're asking, what will be the impact of, of that water being used for recharge? But that will be part of the task for objectives. Thank you. So the last uh, water source that we were analyzed is the potential delivery of uh, additional untreated water to uh, Ramona Municipal Water District from the San Diego County Water Authority through the first aqueduct, and then that water being uh, conveyed to the San Pasqual Valley uh, through their uh, Ramona Municipal Water District draw water system. So they provided an estimated annual volume that could be delivered uh, based on their existing capacity, conveyance capacity, as well as their existing commitments to of water deliveries they're already doing with that system. 
And so they provided these two alternatives, um, 850 acre feet per year up to 3,350 acre feet. And uh, these could be delivered uh, directly uh, to a recharge project or in lieu of, of recharge uh, as a way to irrigate with this water. So the, the great advantage of, of this uh, source is that it's important water source. Uh, the San Diego County Water Authority gets its water from uh, Metropolitan Water District and uh, also local supplies. So that, that is an advantage uh, because it's less sensitive to, to the San Pascual Valley lo local conditions. And the other advantage is that the use of existing infrastructure, and in this case, they convey the water very close to San Pascual Valley, so um, conveyance loss is less. And also the seasonality delivery is more flexible. The challenges is uh, the, there might be a, a large construction project that is required, and, and Sally will, will talk about that potential alternatives to convey the source. And uh, the connection point could limit recharge, uh, could limit the recharge. And also uh, we need to uh, consider the complex, the potential complexity for the Water Authority first aqueduct in their, in their future operations that could restrict um, the ag uh, customers. So those are the, the challenges that we identify for this source. And now Sally is going to talk about um, the potential delivery conveyance deliveries for this source. I'm oh, sorry, the recharge location criteria. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. So um, for this potential water supply source, we took it a little bit further than some of the other ones um, because we wanted to get some input on potential recharge options. So this uh, water supply would be recharged to the basin, you know, potentially recharged to the basin via recharge basins, possibly injection wells or um, even in lieu recharge where uh, it'd be used for irrigation and then offsetting groundwater pumping. Um, looking at the recharge location, um, we set a couple of criteria to help us um, identify potential feasible options. Um, and these are, these are the, the big picture criteria we're looking at. So um, enhancing retention of water within the eastern portion of the basin. So again, that's focusing on those areas of the basin where we've been talking about recharge um, being the easiest and most beneficial. So the same portion of the basin we've been talking about all day. Um, prioritizing the recharge locations within city parcels to help us streamline uh, some of the permitting processes. Um, it's generally just a little easier <laughs> um, for us. Trying to reduce the amount of infrastructure that would be necessary. So looking for what is a, a shorter pipeline um, between where we can connect to Ravona MWD's system and where we might recharge the water. Um, locating recharge areas in near existing roadways, so we're looking for accessibility. Um, that'll also help keep costs and efforts lower. Prioritizing these recharge locations near representative monitoring wells, so that'll help us make sure that, that we are both effectively recharging water and keeping an eye on any impacts that the use of raw water may have on groundwater quality because we don't want to protect groundwater levels but then create an issue with quality. You know, we don't want to reduce quality in the groundwater basin, um, certainly not below any sort of uh, standards. And then we want to minimize disturbance to existing active agricultural land. So we wouldn't want to put a recharge basin on a parcel that's already has an orchard on it, for example for example. So we want to minimize those disturbances to those existing active um, activities that, that are already there. Kind of generally speaking, um, we have identified a few areas um, within the basin that could be where within which we might locate some recharge, um, you know, recharge facility. So we identified eight recharge areas Again, we haven't vetted these with any of our stakeholders like this group um, or any of the permitting agencies. So they're, they're really conceptual right now. Um, and we'd love some feedback on them as we get into public comments. That's why we're bringing it to you today. Um, just to acknowledge that um, recharge areas one is, is 
this one along Santa Isabel Creek, and two is along Santa Maria Creek, so it's really taking advantage of the permeable stream, stream bed here. Um, and then areas three through eight, so the remaining areas are kind of city within city-owned parcels, which obviously um, have been leased out to some of you. <laughs> so uh, you see them all kind of there. Um, what we did is there's two different potential areas where we can connect into the Ramona MWD raw water system. So their system is shown here with the blue dashed lines. Um, so this is their raw water system. It connects kind of south of this photo. Um, and at the first connection point, this is from their ROB zone, their ROB pressure zone, we can get up to 3,350 acre feet of water. Um, what you see here are some proposed, you know, kind of potential pipelines to get us to the recharge um, areas that were previously identified. So kind of drop down here along this canyon and then run along the road here. Uh, so for some of these, uh, recharge areas we could we would go this way and then cross over San Maria Creek over here to get to eight and seven. Um, the rest of them would follow along here, along the road here, um, ultimately um, connecting at the very last point here to recharge area one at the discharge point. So we ultimately wouldn't be using under this proposed pipeline, for example, if we went to Santa Isabel Creek, we would not be dumping water here because obviously the water would flow this direction. So here we were trying to keep the pipelines within kind of existing roadways um, and then looking at, you know, what's the furthest, kind of the, ultimately the furthest spot within, um, say, recharge area five, we wanted to account for a pipeline going all the way to the furthest area, but potentially, you know, maybe there's a better spot here, in which case the pipeline might move. Um, basically, it's a shared a shared route, um, which is turnoffs for each of the recharge areas. Um, it would be an eight inch pipeline. Uh, that should be sufficient for a recharge basin. We really don't think there's a lot of additional infrastructure that's needed um, at this point based on kind of the preliminary analysis. Um, similarly, this is uh, the other diversion point in Ramona MWD system. What you'll see here is this is what we're calling the snow. This is from their snow zone. Um, here, there's only 850 acre feet of water available, um, but it would just come here down along the road, and then it would be similar, you know, we're thinking similar kind of pipeline alignments all along the same routes for the same kind of purposes um, and turnouts. Again, it'd be an eight inch pipeline. So this would be for essentially a recharge basin. If we did end up wanting to go the route of something like uh, injection wells, um, we would likely need to consider some additional infrastructure like um, some treatment facilities, surface water treatment facilities, or potentially um, a pump station to make sure we have the pressure that's needed. Um, so there's a couple considerations if we go from a recharge basin and those are things like Nate has been saying and Paula has been saying that we'll explore in uh, the recharge strategy development in task four. But we wanted to just show you kind of where we're thinking some of these options might be to get feedback on them. So that's the end of us talking <laughs> about our slides. Um, so we're opening it up for public comments. We have here a couple of questions that you've heard me asking um, earlier in the presentation. Just uh, these are questions that would be really helpful for us to hear from you about um, in informing our TM4 development. But we will, of course, we'd love to get any other comments that you guys have on the information shared today. Um, but we want to just open it up here. Uh, the first bullet is really related to TM2 that uh, Nate was presenting earlier, and the remaining bullets are more geared towards TM3, so the, the recharge water supply TM. I take a stab at this. It's Matt Whitman. Great. Thanks, Matt. Sure. 
uh, kind of starting at the top. Um, when you talk about the uncontrolled releases from Sutherland, and this is based on my 40 years out here, any of the times that Sutherland has spilled uncontrolled, the basin was already full. You know, there's a whole watershed downstream of Sutherland and Santa Maria Creek and then Wajito Creek. So to even to consider any strategy that has to do with the uncontrolled releases doesn't seem to make any sense unless they change the way Sutherland operated to where it stayed fuller and would more frequently spill. Um, next comment I would say in regards to the, the infiltration, and it also uh, uh, plays into the recharge, you know, same, same thing from my experience out here, it's happening now even, you know, the, the stream flow is it enters the valley and the basin is very low like it is, it rapidly soaks in and rapidly goes once the big surge happens the water retreats upstream until that part of the basin fills and then gradually it works its way westward as an example right now you know the first half a mile maybe of the far eastern basin that's mine the the groundwater which was in excess of 160 feet below channel level is now full so there's no more soaking in going in that a little bit of rain we got last night caused the creek to to go another two three hundred yards downstream but it's all just soaking in because that's that's what it does and if recharge operations commence in the valley if you use a stream bed that's exactly what's going to happen it's going to rapidly take the water until you get a localized filling of the groundwater basin and then it'll it'll move its way downstream um, one information I saw in some of the background information on your creek flows, uh, 2008 and 9, the, the stream flows were hugely impacted by the Witch Creek fire complex. It almost makes the flows during that year irrelevant because we didn't have a lot of rain, but what water came in was so full of soot and ash that it just ran right on through. Didn't affect the wells at all, essentially, until till the organic content of the water started to decrease. And then it finally started to soak in. But even then, it was at a much slower basin. Um, you know, it, it, my opinion, certainly the, the, any recharge strategies should be done in the, in the creek bed where it's natural. Um, you know, would not be in favor of, of any agricultural land being taken out of production to recharge. That kind of defeats the whole purpose. You might as well just take it out to begin with. It stops using water. And then if there's an overdraft, then that overdraft has been re remediated just by taking the land out of production. So it's kind of a concept that doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Thanks. Great, thank you for that. This is Nate. Can I ask you a quick question, Matt? You you mentioned the fire conflict. I, I just didn't catch the name of that and the, that timing. That that's very interesting to me. There's there's parts of our hydrograph with the model that we're able to match better than other parts, and of course the model doesn't think about things like fires. So do you mind just repeating the name of that and that timing again? Sure. The the Witch Creek fire burned in uh, October. 24th, I want to say 2007. We all lived through it. Uh, so the, the the water information from the the water year, whatever you want to cut, 2007, 2008, and then also 2008, 2009, uh, were really impacted by by so much of the basin that was burned. Essentially, the whole Sutherland side of the watershed, much of Wajito, Santa Maria side as well. Uh, all that was burned those years. Also in 2004, quite a bit of the watershed burned as well. Very good, thank you. This is Carol Burkhardt. I just wanted to uh, comment <clears throat> that the Witch Creek fire actually happened on October 21st of 2007. It went through the 24th, as Matt said, it went on and on for days, but it came through our valley on the 21st and our home was lost in that fire on the 22nd. 
that's why I remember. <laughs> so if you need dates and looking up that fire online, those are the dates. Which Creek Thank fire? You. I have a question. This is Peter. Um, looking at bringing the Ramona water in or the, through the Ramona district, it looks like you're running pipelines all the way down. Um, but Nate identified um, that your number two uh, infiltration area is the, the bed of the Santa Maria Creek. I was just wondering if you could have a shorter pipeline and discharge to the creek farther upstream and have it just come down in the creek. Mm -hmm. you now, granted, there be some losses, but it might be offset by saving pipeline costs. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, right now, uh, we looked at that to see, gosh, can we put it at the very start of this retreat area? Um, we would have to cut through some private property, though. There's not an instrument there that I know of yet, um, but we, we can certainly explore that option a little bit further. This is Frank Conine. Um, I think reading through the report, just a couple of follow up comments on Peter's comments right now. I think reading through the report, any of the stuff along the Santa Maria Creek was found to be undesirable because it did not give enough support to the far eastern portion of the basin. Um, and so that's why I think uh, that 278 and six were not as desirable as one, three, four, and five. Um, but as a follow-up, uh, the infiltration in, in as, once again, as a, as a lifetime resident of the Valley, I think that the infiltration of Santa Maria is far less than the infiltration of the Santa Isabel. And part of that reason is um, how much rock formation is probably underground of the valley floor coming off that mountain when you're close close to the mountain. It just seems that, that that stream continues to always run for a longer period of time. And my assumption is because of poor infiltration in the upstream portion. Yeah, good good feedback. Thank you, Frank. Frank, your comment about this morning seems to confirm that. Correct. Um, Nate, as a as a follow up to your earlier slide where you were showing the relationship, I went and I pulled up that slide and looked at it a little bit carefully. Um, that slide is showing the amount of precipitation and how long or the extended frequency of the three different creeks were running. It would probably be interesting if you could add the, the level of the USGS well somehow overlay that on that same map. And that's just uh, because it's cool to look at sometimes at, at information like that. Yeah, I, th I think that's on that plot. If it's the one I'm thinking of, that's figure 4-4. Four, four. Um, that that's that brown line, that SDSY. Oh, there she's she's pulling it in. Okay, that so in the, brown version, line in the version that we got, I don't. I gotta switch back. Um, okay, I see. Okay, I see that brown line, but okay, so that is the DTW SDSY. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's the depth to water at, at, at that monitoring well. So that's the okay. right axis. Yep, yep. No, okay. it's a, yeah. So it's now, a, now I, understand, I understand that better, and I thank you for that clarification. You bet. Um, if, if I was going to add another, you know, I'm not the landowner, I'm a lessee, but it seems to me that um, your alignments were going down roads and 
anytime you go down roads, there's going to be a lot of extra cost and right away, um, you know, working with the city. Uh, if 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 you go down this route, um, you know, I, I think it should also be looked at uh, what are availabilities of using farm roads and 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 working around existing farm roads that uh, may be a cost consideration. Great, thank you. Um, nothing was mentioned for this Francona again, nothing was mentioned about um, theories of cost on this water being imported from Ramona. Um, is it a benefit as Ramona grows to be able to have an outfall? Um, is there a treatment cost that they have to cover? Um, are, are there any theories about uh, what kind of financial impacts this imported water may create on an ongoing basis to the valley and turn around and affect uh, what what uh, what the city of San Diego does with lessees out here in the valley? So costs have not been factored in yet and um, that's part of what we're exploring as we move forward with feasibility um, of these so i don't have an answer uh, for you now with a cost estimate but uh, if there is uh, you know if we're going to be purchasing raw water there's the cost of the water and the conveyance of the water um, one of the considerations when we're moving forward with feasibility and developing the strategy is, as I kind of mentioned briefly, um, injection wells would likely require some additional surface water treatment um, versus just a recharge basin that infiltrates, or if we, you know, we put the water into the creek where it'll infiltrate naturally, there'd be less treatment involved, which would reduce, you know, represent potentially a cheaper option. Um, but we don't have dollars and cents yet. Um, to share with you today. Thank you. Can I just make a comment about injection wells? I built a few and operated a few, um, and um, they're a lot of trouble in general. I mean, like you say, you're going to really have to polish the water before you put it down and Hope you don't get any uh, microbial growth in there on top of that. So I think, you know, given the nature of the sediments in the creek, it's a lot better choice to try to infiltrate in the creek or maybe just even over the banks a bit than uh, than injection wells. I, I understand that they're they're very useful uh, when you have no space to operate in or when you need to get through, you know, several hundred, you know, tens of feet of clay to get down to sand and gravel below. Um, it just seems like, you know, you, you're going to have to run the numbers, but don't underestimate the, the operation and maintenance costs on injection wells. Thank you. That's really good feedback for us to hear. Um, are there any other sort of things that we should be considering when we're looking at the feasibility of these um, these supply sources? So we're hearing, you know, uh, uh, that you want us to to make sure that we're considering those costs, looking at opportunities for adjusting locations um, to perhaps reduce the costs. It sounds like there's there seems to be a preference for trying to use uh, the creeks for the infiltration. Um, any other sort of considerations that haven't been mentioned? If I missed something you already said, we have it in our notes, I promise. <laughs> Hi, this is Joel Kramer. Oh, sorry. Um, 
I'll be quick. Please go ahead. Uh, agricultural specialist at the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County. Um, we've been doing a lot of outreach to the ag community as part of a planning pro uh, project and water costs have been paramount. And so a couple questions uh, have come up about groundwater recharge. Sorry, I wasn't here if they were um, answered earlier. One, um, is there connectivity between um, the aquifer in Ramona and the San Pasqual Valley? Um, because I know that Ramona residents would greatly benefit from groundwater recharge as well. And secondly, um, I've heard of a, a city of San Diego desalination plant that um, is in the valley that was previously in use and is not currently in use. And I was wondering if there's any consideration of reactivating that as part of this project. Thank you. The, I can speak to the first one. The connectivity, I think, is largely through Santa Maria, Maria Creek. You know, they're, they're different groundwater basins. They're, in terms of direct groundwater to groundwater communication, it, you'd have to go through a lot of low permeability rock. <clears throat> but the, you know, the Santa Maria Creek, that, that's kind of your connection between the, the two basins. If, um, I think that was your, your first question, Joel. I'll have to defer to the city on the desal. I, I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Uh, this is Julie with the City of San Diego. And as of this point, no, there is no plans in the future to be looking into bringing the diesel back online. Thank you. Sally, this is Nate. What, one thing just to ask an open-ended question. You had a map there that, um, and you did mention, you know, the term in lieu recharge, but just to maybe put a little bit more meat on that bone. You know, one, one question I have is, um, you know, these areas that are marked like two, seven, eight, six, I guess just conceptually from, from the locals perspective, would it make sense? Um, you know, the concept of bringing in water into from Ramona, say, and to put into storage ponds, and then maybe some of those areas that are like area four or five or six or these areas, if you had like a dual connection type of a situation where you could, when available opportunistically, pull off of these, these storage ponds, um, you know, use your same distribution for your irrigation network, but just have that ability to switch over and pull off those ponds and, and then in lieu of groundwater pumping. So I guess that that was a kind of a concept that in case that wasn't totally clear when we first went through this, but I'd just be curious in general, does does something like that in, in your setting with your operations, does that make sense? Because that, that's something we're kind of curious about. Yes, Matt, uh, potentially that could work. You know, it's it's uh, it kind of depends on how the system is designed, obviously, and how how if this is a seasonal kind of a flow or a non or a constant flow of an avocado grove where I put up against Highland Valley as an example that that used to get water from Ramona, we're now on a well. So I mean, in that situation, that grove could be fairly easily converted to using that water but you know the kind of acre foot quantities you talk about kind of depending the 850 is not an insurmountable number if you start talking about 3,000 4,000 acre feet that's a big number for any any storage container and to integrate with your irrigation system over you know that's that's multiple farms or if it's something that wasn't used constantly then it becomes you know very expensive to to have the potential to use 100 percent of the of the recharge water some years and no percentage the other years because you have to maintain your 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 non-recharge irrigation system fully just to, to be able to operate year to year. Yeah, that I think it makes sense. Questions at all? Yeah, very, very helpful. Um, just want to right off the back, you know, if it was, I hate that option or no, there, there's, it could potentially work under certain, you know, conditions. 
like you said, storage is a big thing of how do you manage storage? And then would you also want another outflow that in the event you have excess water, could that then be routed up, you know, under a creek bed somewhere, you know, so you're beneficially using uh, water from the storage pond to, to offset pumping. Then if there's, if there's even extra beyond your demand, could that be directed somewhere else just purely as recharge in the basin? So just, yeah, you have to really get creative with a such a flashy um, system of just trying to take advantage of these opportunities when they're there. Any other thoughts related to Nate's and the question about potential in lieu recharge of this, maybe having some storage ponds and then drawing from it directly? Any other thoughts that folks would like to share with the group? Um, we've still got a little bit more time for comments or questions. Um, I have a handful of slides to go through before we wrap up, though. If if there's no other questions, Sally, I don't know if this is the appropriate time for this comment, but I know that uh, in early October, Matt Whitman and myself uh, and the Rancho Wajito echoed, we had some comments and concerns about the level of Lake Hodges and how it could be affecting the groundwater level in our basin mm -hmm. and with the ongoing uh earthquake repairs and concerns the extended uh the extended length of time that the lake will be maintained at a lower level than has historically been present or that would be reflected in our modeling and um we haven't yet heard a response or or, or i haven't heard a response and and I'm wondering if at this point, if somebody is prepared to discuss or when we may be hearing some discussion about uh, how the level of Lake Hodges impacts the groundwater level in this basin. Mm -hmm. Sally, I can hop on that. So again, um, so Frank's uh, apologies that we haven't actually formally responded. Um, and I thank you for bringing that back up again. We thought it was actually a really interesting point that you brought up. Unfortunately, at this point, our contract is tapped out and we wouldn't be able to start up an official new task to look into this, but we do think it has merit. So we are actually engaging in a new contracting process and we're also looking for grant funding right now too. Uh, we, we, we actually just applied for some grant funding and we're expecting to hear back soon on that. And we're hoping that with this new contract and this additional grant funding, we'll find an avenue to actually open this up and take a look. And also, as we get a little bit further along, we are hoping that we'll hear more um, from the Division of Safety of Dams about this, about what the future for Hodges is going to look like. So we're also anticipating we're going to get more answers about what it is going to look like, especially operationally in the next few years while we do, while we work towards a permanent solution. Um, but we do, we hear you and we do want to look into what is that going to mean for the basin in the meantime. Thank you, Julie. Um, Nate, have you considered it in, uh, as I understand, you're one of the key people behind the modeling going on in the basin have you taken it into account somehow or are, are, are we acknowledging that uh that current results uh over the last year may not be reflective of historical results based upon some undetermined correlation yeah so good question we we do have in the in the model um at the very end of the basin, there is a, a feature in there that is tied to the stage of Lake Hodges. And so historically over that 15 year period, um, you know, there are, there are daily and monthly data available that, yeah, it's kind of a, 
the, the outflows are a bit tethered, if you will, to what's happening there. Um, and then when we did the future projections, we had also included that cap. And I, it's escaped me right now. It's been long enough. I don't remember the, the value, but those uh, DSOD restrictions were incorporated into the projections in the GSP. Um, so we haven't looked at that in, in recent time, but um, now you've asked the question, you know, as we look, as we, you know, get into task four and do some modeling, we can at least understand that that's some, there may be some interest to just think about what the outflows are to Hodges. So yeah, it, we're, we're not, yeah, we won't be looking at it in detail on this one with, with the recharge strategies per se, but um, if there's something informative that, you know, as through the course of doing our work that, that can shed some light on this, we certainly will share it. Thank you. Sure. Hi there. Uh, this is Joel Kramer again, our CD San Diego. Um, among the the water sources, I didn't see um, treated water from the city of Escondido. I know they're doing a major expansion of their recycled water plant and are pumping that water east and over hills to uh, areas at least uh, north of, if not upstream of San Pascual Valley. Is there a reason that's not on the sources list? I believe that uh, most of the water that Escondido is doing already essentially has um, identified customers. This water from Ramona was identified by Ramona as water that you know, they're, they would be willing to provide um, to us. Um, it's not water that they already have customers that are using. Um, but I don't know, Julie or, or Stacy, if you had any other response. I'm afraid I don't. I think it is, uh, it just is at that, that my understanding was the same as yours, Sally. Um, that's that's exciting because I've um, I'm under the understanding that uh, they're willing to divert more money. I uh, sorry more water if there are additional customers available, and I'm happy to provide a connection at Harf if that's helpful. Yeah, um, I mean we'll take it. <laughs> we'll we'll take a point of contact. Um, yeah, as far, you know, I don't think we realize that there might be an option there. Um, there's a consideration for using treated water versus you know raw water just there's typically additional costs associated with that treatment um but yeah if you could send over a little bit more information um we can look you know we can we can explore whether that's that's really a viable option for us or not Um, all right. Well, if there's no more, oh, I see something in the chat. Hold on. Oh, that's just Joel. All right. Thanks, Joel. <laughs> so again, um, we'd, we'd love to get any comments as you have time to read through the different TMs. If you have additional thoughts, uh, please let us know. Um, but our next steps here are really to delve into developing these recharge strategies as task four. Um, so a lot of, I think, the details that folks were asking about, you know, you'll see more of that in task four. Um, as Nate has mentioned, we're working on updating the model and running some simulations um, that will incorporate these recharge strategies. So incorporating the data from task two and then the recharge strategies, that'll all be done in task five. Um, so we're going to have a workshop again in April um, where we'll be providing those updates on model refinements and we'll be going into more detail on the potential recharge strategies. Concurrently, we're working on the 2022 annual report, so we're compiling it now, um, and it's going to be submitted to DWR by April 1st and posted to our website after the submittal. So you'll also see a few slides in April about the annual report, and if you have any comments on the annual report um, at our next workshop, you know, we'd be happy to hear those comments as well, but we'll provide a brief summary um, next time as well. 
again, this is our schedule. Um, as soon as we have a date for the April workshop, we'll let you know, but I would anticipate kind of mid to late April for that. We will be having another workshop kind of June, July timeframe um, on the model, and then again uh, in early fall on the groundwater dependent ecosystems. These are um, our management actions from our uh, GSP. So we just wanted to provide a brief update on each of these management actions. Um, so the management action three, support water quality improvement plan actions, that's just ongoing. Um, same with management action four, which is collaborating regionally with other entities for monitoring and implementation of regional projects. Um, management action five is education outreach for TDS and nitrate. We have developed some outreach materials. Um, those are completed. They'll be distributed uh, soon via email and then posted to our website. Um, so you'll get an email that uh, with the link to those materials. Um, we're continuing to coordinate with the city on the Hodges Watershed Improvement Project, which is uh, Management Action 6. Um, we are, of course, in the middle of Management Action 7, the initial surface water recharge evaluation. Um, now you, you've seen we're just about halfway uh, through our, our tasks. <laughs> and then we are kicking off um, in February, so this basically this month, um, a desktop study, a phase one desktop study on groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, so it's a separate management action, but some of the information here will be used to inform our feasibility study. Um, here are just some links uh, to uh, some of the materials. Uh, you can find them on our website um, here, which you should all have the link to. Um, the GSP is there, the annual report is there. We'll be posting the 2022 annual report as well. Um, and then we also have a link to our data management system. So if you want to see some of the data, um, you can visit this website. Uh, it does require a login, but uh, you can all register if you don't already have a login. So uh, with that, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Again, if you have any final questions, please, or, or comments, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, and if you have any comments you want to provide us on the TMs later, you can reach out to Stacey. Um, you should all have her email address, um, but if not, let us know. Stacey and Julie, any final thoughts? No, thank you, Sally. No, thank, thank you so much, Sally. Well, I hope everyone has a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you again for being here. Bye, everyone. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.